Let's talk about some repairs that you may run into with a partial denture case. Once in a while, we have the need to repair a removable partial denture, but we should do everything in our power to minimize this occurrence by one, careful diagnosis. And by this, I mean we should really have mounted diagnostic casts to analyze the occlusion on a case. By intelligent treatment planning, adequate mouth preparation, effective partial denture design, and by the proper fabrication of all the component parts of the partial. When you know you have to do a denture repair, ask yourself the following questions. One, can I make a repair using the denture alone? Like um, a broken tooth on a complete denture where uh, all of the teeth are in line and the occlusion opposing it is pretty natural. Two, do I need other teeth on that same arch in order to make a repair? For instance, if I'm going to add a clasp, I need both the partial denture, but I also need the natural teeth showing on the cast so that I can bend that wire to place it around that tooth. Or if I'm going to add a tooth to an existing partial that's next to two adjacent natural teeth. Ask yourself, do I need an opposing cast mounted uh, for development of an occlusion involved with my repair. Let's say I'm going to repair an old partial and we're going to extract four anterior teeth and we're going to add four teeth to the existing partial. You're going to have to have an opposing cast for occlusion uh, in order to establish that occlusion for the new repair that you're doing. Then the other thing, do I need new tissue surface on which to work? Do I need to have a reline impression as well as some of these other things? On this slide you can see an example, first of all, of that single complete denture repair where the denture is thick and other teeth are provided on the denture. There's a good facial profile and the crest of curvature is pretty straightforward. On this particular case, and if the occlusion opposing that denture is pretty normal, you can go ahead and make that repair without having an additional cast board. So this is an example where repair can be made without making a cast. But down below, where you're going to put an attitude to a partial in an area that's between two natural teeth, you have to take an impression so that you can have the central and the uh, lateral on this cast so that you know where to position that central incisor that you're repairing on that partial denture. You need to ask yourself, do I need teeth or tissue detail on the arch in order to make a repair? If so, do I need a cast? The first picture shows that we're going to add a clasp to, that is broken off of this removable partial denture. How am I going to add that clasp if I don't have a tooth next to that partial denture? So what's required here is that I put this partial denture in place, I take an over impression with alginate, and I pour up my impression and I get the cast shown in the second picture. Down below, tooth number five is going to be extracted on this particular patient. All right, if tooth number five is going to be extracted, don't I need tooth number four and tooth number six to be on the cast when I remove tooth number five so that I know where I'm supposed to place this tooth number five? In order to obtain it, I have to put this partial in the mouth, take an impression, pour that impression up. I'll get the result like I see on the patient's right bottom picture and then I can remove tooth number five and repair it on the partial denture. Clasp arms are broken because of a number of factors. One, repeated flexure of a clasp into and out of an undercut that's too deep may result in clasp breakage. Sometimes, even if the perio is adequate and the arms are in the proper undercut, metal fatigue causes the clasp arm to break. Two, component parts may break if they are improperly polished and finished during the construction of the prosthesis. This 
is very hard to determine as a factor causing the breakage. 3. Adjustment of the occlusion on arms and rest due to failure by us to meet adequate clearance for the metal in the mouth may result in the failure and breakage of a clasp. You can also have inappropriate taper to clasp arms and lack of uniform thickness of the clasp from its terminus and from its origin to its terminus. We have to avoid excessive manipulation of clasps during initial fitting of the prosthesis because careless re, uh, handling of our pliers and repeated bending of the clasp may result in a breakage. The most frequent occurrence of breakage is accidental dropping of the prosthesis by the patient. Lastly, repeated use of clasp arms to remove the prosthesis may eventually result in failure. Cast clasp cannot be adjusted as many times as wrought wire clasp before it breaks. Even the wrought wire can be over adjusted and breakage can occur. The good news is that a wrought wire clasp can often be used to replace a broken cast clasp arm. A broken cast clasp can be replaced by a wrought wire is often a question on the board examinations. The first step in the procedure to add a clasp to an existing RPD is to make an impression of the arch with the partial denture in place. This impression technique will produce a cast with the adjacent natural teeth present on it. These are the teeth that will be needed to bend the wire for the partial and to add the actual clasp to it. Realize that you need those natural teeth in the arch that are not on the partial denture in order to be able to bend a wire that will fit in place on the partial denture. Place the partial denture in the mouth and make an over impression using alginate. When the alginate is set, remove the impression from the mouth and very likely your partial denture will remain within the impression. If it has pulled loose, be sure that you reposition it into the impression and that you get it into exactly the same spot. Also check to make sure that you have a good uh, impression in the area where you're going to make the repair. If not, you maybe need to take a new impression. The next step is to lubricate the plastic area of the partial denture with a material like Vaseline to prevent the stone or the gypsum product from getting into the acrylic pores. Next, Block out any undercuts in the acrylic with either wetted paper towel or wetted tissue. You can also use block out putty, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes how to use that. Block out any other clasp assembly area that is not affected in the repair. What we're trying to do is we're going to need to be able to remove this partial denture from the cast and any undercuts will prevent us from doing it and then trying to do it will possibly damage our partial denture. Here's a view of the final cast. Our object is to be able to lift that partial denture off the cast easily and by removing all undercuts then we're able to get that partial off the cast without forcing it and possibly causing more damage to our partial. Putty works exceptionally well for this and I'm going to show you in the next few slides what we can do with that. Um, notice on number 29, there's a clasp arm. I like to block out that tooth in the impression also because it just makes for one less um, interference when I'm trying to remove that partial denture from the cast. Here is Siltec putty that's available at the South Lab Dispensary. It's a special precision putty designed for laboratory use. The product comes in either condensation silicone or vinyl polysiloxane. Both products have a high shore hardness, fast setting, and elastic and heat resistant characteristics. All of these qualities make it ideal for use in constructing a ridge area in an impression where the impression or the partial can be removed from small undercuts that exist in the mouth or on the cast. It can also be used to block out undercuts. 
it has a catalyst that initiates the set of the material and it can be used to do laboratory repairs without damage to the partial or staining of the prosthesis. It cannot be used when laboratory heat cured processing is to be done as it is flexible and would not withstand or stand up to the pressures that are used in pressing the acrylic into the flasking mechanism. We usually use one level scoop to one and three fourths inch of catalyst. Now you may not need that much if all you're going to do is block out undercuts. It is not able to be used as an impression material intraorally. You'll see how we use this in the next few slides. Here's an example where we want to add a tooth and a clasp in the area of tooth number 12 and 11. So we took an impression over the partial denture in place and this is the result we had. Any undercuts in the flange will be blocked out with Siltec putty, but in addition to this, we're going to actually reconstruct the ridges in the putty also. This will make it very easy to remove the partial from the cast that may have undercuts. We may work our repair against this material and it does not distort with the liquid powder resin when it's mixed. It also does not distort as that material goes through a heat phase where it gets very hot nor does it stain or stick to it. This material can also be used when constructing a remount cast for the complete denture delivery appointment. Note that the material does not go completely up to the edges of the flange. We want the hard plastic to bottom out on the stone for a nice solid base on which to place our partial denture and give it support. Also notice that you must have very large undercut areas in the Siltec in order to provide retention for those ridges. They do not bond to stone. They must be retained by undercuts. Here is our final poured cast. Note that we also put some Siltec putty in the clasp assembly of the area where we were not going to be doing the repair. The Siltec putty makes for a nice ridge replacement and the partial can easily be removed over those undercuts because the Siltec putty is soft and will give. This will eliminate any of the possibility of distorting that partial when we take it off and work on it and then place it back on the cast. Here are two final casts produced for repairs using the overimpression technique to provide the natural teeth and the partial denture on the same cast. Let's look at the upper cast first and add a tooth to the existing partial. First, remove tooth number five. Then, cut a retentive groove in the plating that backs that space. This can be done with a separating disc. The cut should be at least three millimeters in width, and it would be wider at the bottom than it is at the top in order to provide retention. If there is no plating, you would have to add a loop to the existing major connector. You may add a loop anyway, if you'd like, to the other. Next, select a tooth that fits into the area and place retentive undercuts into that denture tooth. Then you're going to head and apply acrylic resin to the undercuts and then to the area of the repair. Note that that repair material will go on the lingual aspect of the major connector and connect all the way over to the uh, base in the posterior area. After adding the acrylic, place the cast in warm water in a pressure pot at 20 to 25 pounds of pressure for 15 minutes. After that, remove the teeth on both sides of the repair area for easy removal of the prosthesis from the cast. Then remove any acrylic that is into the undercuts. It will prevent seeding. See the arrows on the picture below. You're now ready to try in the prosthesis, but don't force it into place. You may still have some flash in those interproximal areas that needs to be removed. Adjust the occlusion when it's fully seated. And if necessary, pay, place a reline material into the ridge area if it does not adapt well to the tissues. You need some support in that area. 
Then polish and administer oral hygiene and care instructions and let the patient go. Make an appointment just to check to make sure she has no sore spots. This is the case we're going to add a class to the existing RPD. Removal of the acrylic is necessary for placement of the wrought wire clasp. This can be done on the facial, preferably on the lingual shown in that lower illustration where the blue is drawn. The acrylic was very thin on the lingual aspect of this partial and we'd have to have kind of a lump of acrylic on the lingual side, so it was decided to remove the buckle acrylic. Prepare a clasp arm using either 32 or 36 gauge orthodontic wire for that arm. You have to bend it into position using the three prong and the bird beak pliers. A pen pencil made with a wax makes it easier to bend the wire appropriately like you were taught in orthodontics class. The preparation of the tooth must allow for the wire plus acrylic resin on top of the wire to be hidden inside that partial denture. The wire should also have some form of a retentive loop or a kink in it to prevent rotation of the clasp arm within the acrylic. Place the wire within the confines of the preparation. A little bit of sticky wax should be placed upon the wire in the area of the tooth where no acrylic resin is going to be added. It will help hold that in place while the acrylic work is done. The items that you'll need for the uh, task will be shown in this picture. They include a color guide for jet acrylic when a tooth colored area is involved. You have to be able to match it. Then you will use a total of four dappen dishes. Two will be, be used for the jet liquid and powder and two will be used for the repair acrylic which is the pink material to produce gum colored tissue and the one for liquid and one for powder. You'll also need a little brush to use with your repair. Um, other items that might be useful for you would be a little instrument like a plastic instrument and a wax spatula for mixing the material. Place the tooth colored material in one dappen dish and the liquid in the other. Then using the little brush, dip the brush into the liquid and then into the powder and place the material in the tooth area that you have prepared. After adding the acrylic, add a little uh, extra, make it sure that it is kind of humped up and you can actually trim it down after it sets because you're going to get some shrinkage of the material. After adding that material, place it into a pressure pot for about 15 minutes with warm water and about 25 pounds of pressure. After that has cured, remove all the stone and polish the acrylic repair area using the necessary burrs, pumice, and acroluster. To deliver the partial denture, first check for flash. Make sure that there's no excess acrylic in the areas that would go into the undercuts next to the natural tooth where you've made the repair. Also, do not force that into the patient's mouth, but also check any undercuts on the tooth where the clasp and the acrylic may be interfering with seating the partial denture. If the clasp arm needs to be adjusted, adjust the wire using a bird beak clasp. The rounded end should be on the inside portion of the clasp. Start at the origin of the wire from the acrylic and slowly bend that wire until you reach the terminus of that clasp arm. You'll ensure better results using this method. The wire should be in contact with the tooth from its origin to its terminus. The tooth should not feel any pressure once this partial denture is seated. Clasp arms are passive in their terminal position. What do you do about fractured occlusal rest? 
Improperly prepared rest seats during the rest preparation phase of construction of the partial denture is where this type of problem usually happens. It's failure to adequately prepare enough material from the tooth. Failure is assumed by the dentist and repairing it by soldering is very questionable. Laser welding is a possibility for you but you need to weigh the cost of making the repair versus making a new denture. Fracture of the occlusal rest almost always occurs at the marginal ridge area where insufficient reduction of the rest seat has occurred during mouth preparation. The repair can be done by soldering the rest. It's first necessary to alter the rest seat to deepen the area of the interference. Sometimes it's helpful also to reduce the opposing tooth cusp. Place the prosthesis in the mouth after the preparation is done and make an over impression pulling the partial denture and pour the cast. Send it to your lab and they will adapt platinum foil to the rest seat and replace the partial denture on the cast. Then, using a fluoride flux, gold solder is electrically fused to the platinum foil and the minor connector. This repair usually works well if additional mouth preparation has been done before the procedure is done. Sometimes breakage occurs in other areas of components. This failure occurred where there was insufficient bulk to the base attachment area. The amount of metal support in this area was very questionable. More base attachment should be present and extend up to and using the guide plane area. Sometimes inadequate design on our part or how the lab executes our design may be the problem, but you need to be aware of the features of a good framework and reject those that are not good. Sometimes this occurs because of abuse of the patient, the most frequent one being that they drop the prosthesis. Repeated adjustment to an area or bends beyond the tolerance of the material will result in breakage. Soldering will not work on this prosthesis in the area where the flange has broken. It will not usually work when a major connector has been fractured. Note the small connections in the area between the major connector and the base attachment. A remake of this prosthesis is indicated. Careful inspection of any framework when it is returned is necessary to determine any framework flaws that might result in a disaster later. Two additional frames are shown in the bottom right pictures. They should have been rejected at the point where you received them from the laboratory. This lab actually should never have sent them out to the dentist in this condition. Assume that the abutment tooth number 31 is to be extracted. We can repair this by adding acrylic resin and a tooth in that area. If you wish to have it completed before the tooth is extracted, you would first make an over impression, pour the cast, cut the tooth to be extracted off the cast, and then add a tooth and acrylic resin to cover the area and the retromolar pad if, if possible for additional support. I do not remove the clasp arms and use them to help retain the denture tooth when I do this type of repair. You may also wait and make an impression after the extraction has taken place and add the tooth at that time. Just keep in mind that it is easier to make this type of repair if you have designed the partial for the loss of the tooth. If it's a questionable tooth, you will want to design the partial as follows. We want to plan for the loss of an abutment tooth if it's questionable. On the left, the major connector finish lines are placed anterior to the posterior edentulous area. Base attachment is then placed in the edentulous area, but there is no major connector in that area. This allows the partial to have a space under the base attachment for acrylic resin throughout that entire area of the partial. When a tooth is lost, 
the acrylic resin can be easily added from there back to cover the retromolar pad and go into retromylohyoid fossa. On the design to the right, the major connector has been extended posteriorly to the last abutment tooth. There is no space under the major connector to help retain added acrylic if a repair is necessary. It will be a more temporary repair if it's done and a remake of the partial will be indicated. Why would I want the major connector to be done like this on the right? Well, if there is no danger in losing that tooth number 18, then that partial denture is much less bulky than the one on the left. The one on the left has to have room under it, and then the metal, and then acrylic on top, whereas the one on the right, it's metal all the way from front to back, and it's much thinner. There are various methods of obtaining occlusion on a relined removable partial denture. You might get a partial denture back from a reline and realize that the teeth are out of occlusion and you need to do something to reestablish the occlusion. You can do so by one, adding autopolymerizing resin to the occlusal surfaces or light activated acrylic resin. This is best achieved if your case is mounted. It's hard to do on each tooth when you try to do it in the mouth. You may also send the case back mounted to the laboratory and have them remove the old teeth and set new teeth and reprocess the case. This is relatively expensive and then it makes you wonder whether you should have remade the partial in the first place. Three, you can fabricate metal occlusal surfaces and have them placed on the denture teeth. This also requires mounting. A reason for doing something like this might be that all the opposing dentition is in metal and it will preserve the occlusion for you. In this example, the patient was real unhappy with this complete denture over a partial denture because the occlusal plane ran downward. Uh, it went downhill and the posterior teeth were evident when she opened her mouth. They were hanging lower than the anterior teeth. So what was needed was that we needed to remove all of the posterior teeth on the partial and on the complete denture and reset those teeth in a superior position so that it, we didn't get that effect of seeing all gums in the posterior area. So I need to ask myself, do I need an opposing cast mounted in order to develop the occlusal scheme with this repair? And the answer is yes. So I need both an upper and a lower cast, and I need this case to be mounted in order to be able to do my repair. Sometimes failure in this area is not all the responsibility of the student. This particular patient reveals huge tuberosities that needed surgery in order to place those teeth at a decent plane of occlusion, but the patient refused to have surgery. One other thing must be considered. Do I need a new tissue surface on which to work? If the partial doesn't fit very well against the tissues, then we can reline the partial and replace all of the teeth at once. This is basically what's involved with a rebase. The steps we would do for this procedure are outlined on the slide. But think about it. If I'm going to replace all the teeth on the existing partial, I'm going to be paying for acrylic work to be done. So why not have a new impression in the tissue area and recreate almost a new prosthesis? Only the framework would remain from the old prosthesis. I must remove, though, any undercuts that are in the current prosthesis before I take my impression. If you want a new tissue surface in the partial, you're first going to remove any undercuts and pressure spots in the partial. Then adjust the borders and border mold it. Next, make an impression in the prosthesis and trim any excess material away after the impression is set so that the patient can completely occlude against the opposing arch. Next, record a jaw registration against the opposing arch with a material that you can remove like Regisil or Blue Mousse. Take that registration and then place it to the side. Next, make an over-impression on that mandibular arch with the partial denture in place 
and then for a cast. Let's consider how we're going to mount the upper cast. We need to record a face bow against the maxillary prosthesis when it's in place. For a complete denture, pour a remount cast so that you can mount the upper denture. For the partial denture, take a new impression in the partial if you wish to have new tissue detail and make an over impression over the partial so that when you pour a cast the partial will be on the cast. The case can now be mounted. You will mount the upper cast using the face bow registration and then you will mount the lower cast to the upper one by using your jaw registration record that you made. We are going to cut off the teeth from the existing dentures and order new teeth as it's difficult to use old ones in this type of case. It's really a good idea to adjust wax rims on the patient to establish a decent plane of occlusion considering the problems that we had with this patient. After mounting the case and adjusting the rims to a desired level, you're ready to send out that case to the laboratory and have the teeth set. Then, have a try-in appointment to verify the patient's satisfaction and make any movements necessary on the teeth to fit the patient and to fit your ideal scheme. Next, get a signature from the patient. Make sure that you have it in writing that she's satisfied before you go through with the processing of this case. This is hopefully the end result that looks much better on this patient and she was happy with the CD over RPD. The occlusal plane is much more desirable. It's level, the back teeth are not hanging lower than the anterior teeth, and there's not as much gingival tissue showing. Part of this was due, though, because we did decrease the vertical dimension somewhat, and we got a much nicer result. She was also more comfortable. There are other types of repairs to the partial that may include the following. Addition of a tooth where a tooth is lost that's not involved in the support or retention of the prosthesis. Sometimes there is a need to solder loops to the major connector in order to retain the teeth to be added to the prosthesis. Also, sometimes we need to fabricate a new clasp assembly and actually solder it to the existing framework. Often we have a replacement of a broken tooth on or a lost prosthetic tooth to the prosthesis. And we may have replacement of teeth due to wear leading to loss of vertical dimension or for aesthetics purposes. In all these cases, evaluation of the cost of repairing the old prosthesis should be compared to the cost of making a new prosthesis. Next, we'll talk about the repair of a maxillary complete denture. The rules that we'll follow will also apply to a broken base area on an RPD. When a patient walks in the door with a broken denture, the first thing that you have to do is to evaluate it as to whether you can repair it. If it's in two pieces, or even maybe three, and the pieces fit absolutely perfectly back together, you may be able to repair that denture. If the patient has attempted to superglue the two parts together and it doesn't fit back together exactly perfectly, then don't even attempt it. You may want to consider whether or not you made the denture before you repair someone else's denture. If you try to repair one that has already been super glued and it doesn't fit quite perfectly, if it doesn't fit in the mouth well, that patient's going to blame you and you've bought a denture. Here's the denture that someone brought into the clinic and it's in two pieces. Those two pieces look like they had a clean break and we're going to try them back together. The two halves of the denture fit perfectly back together with no space anywhere. There doesn't appear to have been any kind of glue added to these two pieces. Uh, sometimes there can be more than two pieces and you can still fit them back together. They can all be repaired. The hard part is to have all three of those you're holding them together and to do some steps that are following it. Um, 
you need to tell your patient that this is a temporary measure. It should last a while, but sometimes they break because the denture didn't fit very well to begin with. Also, you need to tell the dent patient that that denture will discolor over time, that repair material. Now, I suggest that you get an assistant to help you with this particular activity. Place the two pieces in perfect alignment next to each other and place sticky wax on the outside, not the tissue side, but the other side of the denture. And sticky wax it liberally from the beginning of the crack to the end of the crack. You may now do one of two things. Lubricate the denture with Vaseline and take some wet tissue paper or Kleenex and block out all of the undercuts except in the area of the repair and then go ahead and pour a cast into it. The second thing, if you have laboratory putty available to you, you can use the laboratory putty and fill up the denture up to about two to three millimeters from the length of the flange and place some real large, really large undercuts into that putty and pour a cast. Go ahead and take the denture off the cast and clean off all of the sticky wax. After you've done that, try to put the two pieces back on the cast and make sure that you can see where the two pieces fit perfectly together before we go to the next step. You really want the edges of that flange to bottom out on stone for stability. The putty is really nice because it prevents the denture from being locked into place and it also is a nice surface to finish the repair material to. Um, putty is really good for a lot of applications in the dental office. You might want to have some on hand. After you have checked the two pieces of the denture to see that they fit perfectly back together on the cast, you can remove about three millimeters of acrylic to create adequate space for the repair material. Do not remove the tooth material. Maintain the contact between the two teeth, but you can remove the pink acrylic between them. Next, create mechanical locks between the two pieces. I like to use the dovetail preps like it's shown in the picture. Also, bevel the edges around the repair surface so that you have additional surface area for bonding of the acrylic. Then, clean the two pieces of the cast and clean the cast and then place some lubricant on the cast and assemble the pieces back together. Shown in the slide are some of the armamentarium that you need to repair the uh, denture. You will need some repair acrylic and powder. The powder you want the pink with the uh, fibers in it if that's what the denture has. You want two dappen dishes, one for liquid and one for powder. Some of those little disposable brushes are helpful and I like to have a knife handy and I use the Bard Parker blade in the red handle. Also, acrylic resin burrs and then polishing supplies like a gauze wheel. Um, the cone is real helpful when you're doing the palette. Some pumice and liquid and a tin oxide polishing paste like Acroluster. Using a dropper technique, you add acrylic resin liquid to the repair area and then you add powder to the area. You repeat the addition of powder and liquid until the repair area is built up higher than the denture surface because it will shrink as it cures. Be sure to hold the cast at an angle to avoid the material running off of the repair area and into the palette and getting really thick in some of the areas. Some choose to add powder and liquid in a dappen dish first and mix it up. Then they add it to the repair area. The only problem is when uh, you're doing this is that you run into the possibility that the material gets kind of thick before you can get it all into the repair area and you want it to be wet enough so that it bonds really well to the repair surface. Some use the technique where you dip the small brush first into the liquid and pick up a small amount of uh, powder and then add them to the repair area. This technique will take a lot longer when you have a large repair area as you would have on this particular case. 
You can turn the denture around and start to add your acrylic resin powder followed by the acrylic resin liquid to that anterior area of the denture. Um, you can also mix the material up if you want an adapting dish and add it that way or you can take the little brushes and dip it first into the liquid, pick up a little bit of powder, take it to the area, then go back and get some more liquid. What I do do at the very end, again, you, you build it up a little bit taller than the denture, but at the very end what I sometimes do also is I'll take and go back to the liquid because invariably I've gotten some uh, material on the facial surface of the tooth. So I dip my brush in the powder, um, excuse me, in the liquid, and then I'll take that and put it right up along the side of the tooth and spread out my bristles a little bit by pushing up against the tooth, come down and make a dent right at the cervical portion of the tooth. What that does is it gives a little bit of a simulation like it is marginal gingiva and it looks really nice. It clears off all that excess acrylic from the facial surface of the tooth and leaves me less polishing. When you're done applying the acrylic and it starts to lose its gloss, you don't want that glossy surface, go ahead and place the final product into a pressure pot with warm water in it. Do not use hot water because monomer will boil rather easily and when it boils the bubbles will come up and be incorporated into your new acrylic making it very porous. Also when you place it in that pressure pot make sure that the water is all the way up to the top and it is almost starting to come over the edges. Position the lid on the pressure pot and assemble it into this apparatus as shown on the right and then start to turn the handle at the top and bring the pressure up to 20 to 25 pounds of pressure and allow the denture to remain in the pressure pot for approximately 15 minutes. Whenever you remove any denture repair from a pressure pot First, release the pressure valve to let the excess pressure out of the pot before trying to remove the lid. Otherwise, that lid could possibly fly up and hit you in the face. Next, take your time removing the denture from the cast. Think about whether there is a path of removal that's conducive with the undercuts that are on your case. You certainly don't want to break the newly repaired denture. This denture has quite an excess of acrylic resin that has been added during the repair. Remove the excess acrylic down to the level of the original denture and make it very smooth with an acrylic resin burr before taking it to the lathe. Check the tissue side for any excess acrylic or even voids. Repair any voids that you see and then remove the excess resin down to the level of the original denture. On this slide you see the contents of the clinic polishing kit. I'll talk about them in their order. First you have a number 10 round burr and you're familiar with this. You used it to put holes in the custom trays. Secondly is a black acrylic polishing point which is the first of three. It's the one that is the most abrasive. Next is a 557 or 558 lab shank burr and it's used to deepen or widen the frenum attachment area in a complete denture when it impinges upon the patient. Next is the green a polishing, a acrylic polishing point and it's a medium abrasive followed by a small acrylic resin burr that's used for denture adjustments. It's used in areas that are hard to get into. They're kind of narrow. Then it's followed by a tan acrylic resin polishing point and it's the least abrasive. It's the one that puts more of a high shine. These three polishing points are usually used in that order that we just saw them and they're used for smaller adjustment areas. If you have large adjustments you need to take it to the lathes. Next is a large acrylic resin burr that's used for denture adjustments and the very last one is a very large deep cut acrylic resin burr that you want to reserve for soft liners and for those tissue conditioners to get them out of the denture. After the acrylic resin is completely set 
you will polish and finish the repair area using a wet pumice wheel with pumice and or a felt cone with pumice in the palatal area. The cone is really good for that particular area because it gets in that hard to reach area. Then you're going to rinse and uh, dry the denture and follow it with a final shine placed with tin oxide, an example being Acroluster, on a dry gauze wheel that is used exclusively for that material. If you find your denture is not set after your 15 minutes in warm water, that may be a result of someone dipping that little dropper back into the bottle of liquid and allowing it to touch the powder before it goes back into the bottle. When you get any of that powder back into the bottle of liquid, it contaminates the liquid and then the material does not set up adequately. If you find that to have happened, then you're going to have to remove all of that material if it's still rubbery. You might try first placing it in some hotter water and see if it will set up that way, but if it doesn't, you'll have to remove it place it back on your uh, cast and start with a new fresh bottle of liquid. When the dentures finally polished then you can make your appointment to deliver the finished denture to your patient when it's nice and smooth. Um, it's a good idea when you deliver that denture to apply pressure indicator paste to the inside of the denture and seat the denture. It's possible that you could have a little bit of buildup of material that could be causing some pressure on the patient if the denture was not seated absolutely perfectly on that cast. So be sure to check with pressure indicator paste and remove any pressure spots.